Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some work that we've done trying to understand how animals uh, flexibly produce sensory motor behavior. Uh, in order pr to produce a variety of behaviors, uh, neural circuits in the brain must be able to generate patterns of neural activity dependent on both sensory and, and contextual information. We set out to see whether we could understand the generation of sensory motor behavior using the language of dynamical systems. Uh, dynamical systems are controlled by three mechanisms. Uh, one control mechanism <clears throat> is the initial conditions of the system. Uh, this is the state of the system at time zero, or before the dynamics begin evolving. Uh, adjusting the initial conditions in a neural circuit would allow the system to explore different regions of neural state space. Uh, in many behaviors in which sensory input is discrete and occurs prior to motor behavior, uh, it is natural to consider the effects of sensory information as setting initial conditions. For example, as has been done in previous work in the motor cortex by Mark Churchill and colleagues. Another mechanism of control is the external input to a system, here signified by U. External inputs can exert a powerful influence on the dynamics of a system. In the extreme case, <clears throat> a high dimensional input which is temporally complex, could essentially govern the dynamics of the system, making understanding the inherent dynamics difficult. On the other hand, a low dimensional input can reconfigure the dynamics of a system to change its behavior in more interpretable ways. For example, contextual control in prefrontal cortex via such a low dimensional input has recently been proposed by Mante and Cicillo and colleagues. Finally, changes can be made to the function f of x, which governs the inherent dynamics. For the purposes of this talk, I'll assume that f of x doesn't change on the fastest time scales with which sensory and contextual information can change. Instead, changes to f of x may capture changes in synaptic connectivity resulting from learning. Inherent in the execution of any sensory motor behavior is an appropriately timed action. Here, I will argue that we may be able to understand the computations underlying flexible actions using the link flexible timing of actions using the language of dynamical systems by considering the effects of initial conditions and low dimensional inputs on the latent dynamics <coughs> of a network of cortical neurons. The task we use uh, to approach this problem is an elaboration of a previously described uh, time measurement and production task, which we call ready, set, go. The task consists of two main epochs. In the first epoch, two cues, a ready followed by a set, demarcate a sample interval that a subject has to measure. We call this epoch the ready set epoch. In the immediately ensuing set go epoch, subjects have to produce using as accurately as possible an interval using a timed motor response, which we call go, according to the measured interval and, and the context. The relationship between the sample interval and the target interval depend, depends on a scalar gain factor. In the first context, the gain is one and subjects are asked to reproduce the sample interval exactly. In the second context, the gain is 1.5, and subjects are asked to produce an interval one and a half times as long as the sample. Let me show you a few example trials. In 1.5. Throughout the rest of the talk, I will use the colors gray and red to denote the, the gain of one and one and 1.5 contexts. We train two monkeys to, per to perform this task, registering Go responses with a saccade to a visual target. Ready and set cues were flashed visual stimuli, and the context was given by a persistent fixation cue. Here I've illustrated the target interval versus the sample interval for the two contexts using dashed lines. Here I'm plotting the mean plus and minus one standard deviation for several experimental sessions for the gain of one. And here's the data for the gain of 1.5. Finally, the solid lines indicate the fits of a Bayesian observer model to each context. I'd like to bring your attention to two key features of the data. First, the average produced interval increases with the sample interval. Second, the slope of the relationship between the target interval and the produced interval increases between the gain of 1 and 1.5 contexts, indicating that monkeys learned to measure and flexibly produce timed actions according to the rules of the task. How might this task be accomplished by the brain? Previous work in our lab has pointed to a speed control mechanism in which neural activity follows a set path through a neural state space <clears throat> at a rate necessary to reach an action initiating state 
at the appropriate time. To produce a short interval, activity evolves from set to go quickly. Long produced intervals would re require activity to evolve more slowly. The question then becomes, how is speed control achieved in this task? To answer this question, I'm going to focus on the neural dynamics during the set go epoch. In a dynamical system with input held constant, the direction and speed of the dynamics are dependent on the location and state space. We hypothesized that within context, for a single game that is, time varying neural activity in the ready set <clears throat> epoch would generate a continuum of initial conditions from set <clears throat> illustrated by open circles, neural trajectories would evolve, organized in state space according to the initial conditions, to reach an action initiating state at go. Here illustrated by it X. This parametric ordering of trajectories in state space, uh, light and dark lines illustrate slow and fast trajectories respectively, would govern the speed of neural activity, allowing the system to produce the target interval. To control the speed of neural activity across contexts, an external gain-dependent input could then reconfigure the dynamics such that the neural activity evolves at different speeds for the same sample interval. The two structures shown here represent a possible geometric signature of these mechanisms. That is, varying initial conditions and inputs creates two isomorphic manifold-like structures in state space organized by interval and gain. We recorded neural firing rates from dorsal mediofrontal cortex, putatively the supplementary eye field, pre-supplementary motor area, and dorsal supplementary motor area. This region has been implicated in time motor behavior. Low dimensional projections of neural activity recorded in DMSC match the predictions of our hypothesis. Here we see neural activity <coughs> of trial separated, separated into five bins according to produced interval, plotted along the axis which separated data maximally according to interval, and then the orthogonal component of the first principal component of the data. Trajectories are ordered by increasing produced duration, again light to dark, and evolve at different speeds as can be seen <clears throat> by small dots separating 50 millisecond increments and the large dots representing the midway points along each trajectory. Now I've added the neural responses to the gain of 1.5 condition. I'll draw your attention to two features. First, the speed of the trajectories for the gain of 1.5 are slower than those the, for the gain of one. Second, activity is not well organized along the interval axis across both contexts. In particular, responses from both gains at the time of set, that is the initial conditions illustrated by circles on the, on the left, are highly similar across contexts in this projection. Now I'll rotate the trajectories to illustrate <clears throat> the axis along which trajectories were maximally separated across contexts. Here we see that the data follows the prediction of the geometry under a gain-dependent input. To quantify these low-dimensional observations, we performed geometrical analyses using the first 10 principal components of the data, capturing approximately 90% of the variance. <clears throat> I'll spend a bit of time here explaining how we used what we termed kinematic analysis of neural trajectories, or KINET, to quantify the geometry within contexts. We created KINET to measure the relative speed and position of multiple curved neural trajectories, <clears throat> the first step entails finding sets of states, S, along each trajectory, omega, through time closest to the points on the reference trajectory. Here, the middle gray line is the reference trajectory, omega ref, associated with trials of the middle produced interval bin. The light gray line below is omega 1, representing trials of the shortest intervals. The tick marks indicate constant time steps illustrating that omega-1 evolves more quickly. And so, the time T1 it takes to reach S1, which is nearest to S ref, is smaller than the time it took omega ref to reach S ref, to reach S ref. This is what we found in the neural data. After traveling at similar speeds for the first several hundred milliseconds, trajectories evolved associated with shorter produced intervals took less time to reach the same position in state space. Now we're going to take a set of these nearest states and rotate them. We'll call this axis, separating the trajectories in space, the initial condition axis. If the position in state space parameterizes the speed of the trajectory, then there should be an orderly structuring of states along the initial condition axis according to the produced interval. 
We verified this by testing whether successive vectors, delta, omega, connecting states across trajectories pointed in similar directions. In other words, whether their angles were less than 90 degrees. This is what we found. Analysis of the angles between trajectories connect, between vectors connecting these trajectories suggested that the neural activity evol evolved along smooth manifold-like structures through state space at different speeds. Next, we use Kinet to quantify the structure of neural trajectories across contexts, rejecting a number of alternative structures not consistent with our hypothesis. I won't get into the details of this in analysis in the interest of time. First, we, reject we rejected the possibility that neural trajectories evolve towards qualitatively different endpoints. That is, we verified they traveled in the same direction. Second, we verified that the structure of trajectories was similar across contexts, indicating that the effect <coughs> of initial condition was generalized. Third, we verified that there was a meaningful separation between context, between continuous structures generated with, between, within contexts, and that this separation was not collinear with the separation between trajectories across contexts. So we have confirmed that the neural trajectories in the RSG task possess a structure consistent with our intuitions of the behavior of a dynamical system controlled by inputs and initial conditions. We then went on to verify that an artificial system performing the task, a system whose behavior we could fully control and observe, could be described using the same geometrical structure. So we trained a series of recurrent neural networks to perform the gain-dependent RSG task. This network was trained to use two in input pulses denoting ready and set cues and a tonic gain-dependent input to produce an output which reached a threshold at the target interval. Here I'll briefly compare the geometry of the neural data to that of the RNN. We can see that the qualitative features present in the neural data are recapitulated in the, in the network. Like the neural data, the structure of trajectories in the network projected onto the interval axis do not adequately account for the produced intervals. Instead, the tonic input creates two isomorphic structures controlling speed across contexts. In contrast, a network which was forced to rely entirely on initial conditions at the time of set formed a single structure across contexts with trajectories ordered by produced interval along a single initial condition axis. This provides evidence that the structure observed in DMFC could be specific to control by both initial conditions and a low dimensional tonic input. Uh, I want to thank um, my mentor, uh, Meridad Jazieri, uh, collaborators Devika Narayan and Agbal Hosseini, the rest of the Jazieri lab, uh, the Government Institute at MIT, uh, our funding sources, and of course um, uh, the organizers of COSINE for uh, putting on the conference and allowing me to uh, tell you guys a little bit about my work today. And hopefully, time for one question. Thank you. We have time for a question or two. Uh, I have a question, which is, uh, in this geometric analysis, I'm curious as to um, sort of the degree to which you can look at higher order terms, like acceleration of the trajectory, and wh whether you see a lot of uh, change closer to the motor response as opposed to early. Um, so uh, I did show that the, um the speed does not appear to change early on in the in the uh, the psycho epic. I think that's a lot of that has to do with the uh, visual transient evoked by the set cue itself. But we haven't looked at any any higher order terms like uh, like the um, an, uh, acceleration, for example. Great. Uh, a very nice talk. Um, quick question about noise correlation. Did you see any single trial noise correlations? Uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't include the, that analysis, but we did show that, you know, when we look at within a, a particular sample interval, the, the correlation between the, the structure within sample interval is similar to the structure when you look across sample intervals. Thank you. 